All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the final lecture of this semester, last lecture, parasitology. Okay, so um, so after this lecture tomorrow, I'm going to do the, you should know the malaria life cycle. Everybody did that pretty well last, uh, last Friday. And then uh, I'll be doing the slide review. Hopefully you've been going over the slide reviews. Um, since we last met, and I'll be going over the slides again uh, with you tomorrow. Make sure you know how to identify all the eggs, the parasites, the proglottids, um, everything. So 113 slides tomorrow. I'll do that probably two or maybe three times. And then you should be ready for your exams on Friday. All right. So Friday, it's going to be malaria life cycle and slide exam. Okay, let's get this lecture out of the way. All right, parasitology four, last lecture. <clears throat> okay, the dog tapeworm, dipolidium caninum. So in your slide, in your slide reviews, you should have seen uh, what's called an egg packet. This type of worm in part of its development has what's called an egg packet. And it's the only one that has an egg packet. And uh, so you should be able to identify that. And I'll show that to you later. Okay, definitive hosts are dogs, uh, cats, and wild carnivores. Humans are occasional hosts. Uh, the proglottids are passed intact in the feces. So you can find the eggs, the egg packets, et cetera, that, um, in, in the stools, okay? Stool specimens. The host would ingest the egg, uh, larval stages of the dog, and uh, larval stages of dog or cat flea. Oncosphere is a, another um, developmental stage in uh, of this parasite, and it's released into the flea's intestine. So this is similar to malaria, where an oncosphere is actually released into the arthropod vector inside the intestine of the arthropod vector. In this case, it's a flea. Okay. Large inside the flea it develops into an adult, <clears throat> and the vertebrate host, whether it be a dog, cat, or even a, possibly a human, would ingest the adult flea by accident, of course. And humans acquire infection by ingesting the cystocercoid contaminated flea uh, by being around cats and dogs. So you can actually accidentally ingest ingest the flea. Uh, in the small intestine of the vertebrate, you know, dog, cat, or human. Cystocercoid develops into an adult tapeworm. <clears throat> and you saw how long this tapeworm is. This is a dog tapeworm. And it reaches maturity about one month after infection. And here's the life cycle. Okay, you got dogs and cats. Humans would ingest it. They would poop it out and you get the eggs. And here is your egg packet. It's like more than one egg uh, inside one, one packet. And then it uh, goes to the flea, the intestine of the flea, gets to the dog, cat, and then the, where the, it's still in the flea, and then it's accidentally ingested by the human. Poop it out again. All right, so that's the dog tapeworm. Pathogenicity, several hundred uh, human infections have been reported. Usually children less than eight years old, uh, about a third of them are infants. These are young kids, okay? so. Uh, around dogs and cats, so they would, you can see how they could accidentally ingest the flea and get infected. Um, symptoms that are asymptomatic, but they could have abdominal pain, diarrhea, and anal pruritus. Pruritus is uh, another term for itching. It's seen worldwide, uh, human infections reported in uh, Europe, Philippines, China, Japan, uh, Argentina, South America, and uh, the United States. Finding proglottids or eggs in the feces is diagnostic. Uh, egg capsules contain 15 to 25 eggs. And eggs are globular, 30 to 60 microns in diameter. Certain uh, contain an oncosphere with six hooklets. The oncosphere is uh, difficult to identify, but I'll show that to you later on the images. And here's the egg packet. It's easy to identify. You'll be seeing this on 
the slide tomorrow during the review, and you'll probably see it again on your exam on Friday. But this is what an egg packet looks like, Dipolidum caninum, and what the parasite has it. So um, it's a Dipolidum egg packet. And these are the, the eggs with the hooklets, and they're difficult to see. So I probably will not give you uh, this type of slide because um, the hooklets are, are difficult to see. But this egg packet here is diagnostic for Dipolidum caninum. And this is the head, this is the scolex of the worm, and this is a proglottid, okay? It's more, in this case, it's more longer than it is wide. Dipolidum caninum, scolex and proglottid. Okay, the next parasite is a pretty significant parasite. It's called Echinococcus granulosus. And what it does, it causes a, a hydatid cyst and where the worm will will migrate and or travel throughout your body and it could land in uh, one of several organs. Um, could be like the liver, it could be the intestine, could be the brain, uh, any, of, any of these organs where the parasite can land. And it starts off as hydatid sand and then it'll develop and develop and, and, and the parasite will grow. The bad thing about this, it creates a cyst. So in these cysts for Echinococcus granulosus, I heard can be as big as basketballs, okay? So if you can imagine your liver being infected with this parasite or your even your brain or your stomach or your gut, um, if a hydatid cyst will grow uh, to be as big as a basketball, that can be pretty dangerous for the patient. Okay, so this worm, memorize this worm, it looks like, um, you know, it's curved large, uh, abdomen, uh, midsection, and then the head, three sections of this worm. Life cycle is also found in the small intestine of dogs and by eating herbivore organs containing cysts. Gravid proglottids disintegrate. The appropriate host, including man, will ingest the ova accidentally. And if you ingest the ova, that's not good because like I said, the eggs can migrate around and settle and then it can create a hydatid cyst in that organ. The egg hatches, the small intestine releasing hexacanth larva, okay? The larva leaves the intestine, hatches and releases the onchosphere, then enters the circulation, and that's where it can cause damage. The onchosphere is developed into cysts, mainly in the lungs and the liver, or where, wherever it pleases, okay? In this case, this is the brain. So hydatid cyst disease or echinococcosis, hydatid cyst disease or echinococcosis, and it's fatal due to the possible due to possible anaphylactic shock. And uh, echinococcus granulosus is the smallest tapeworm of medical importance. So um, it does cause a serious disease. There's that worm again. So. The worm consists of a body, head, neck, and uh, three proglottids. All three parts are seen as a single unit on the lower power magnification of the microscope. The head has a prominent rostrum, double crown, four prominent suckers, and that's called the cuticulate. The cyst has external laminated non-nucleated hyaline supporting cuticula. It looks kind of like uh, the cuticula looks kind of like um, um, tulip. To me, it kind of looks like a tulip. All right, diagnosis. Uh, clinically found in the presence of slow-growing cystic tumor, okay? So it creates a tumor and close association with dogs. So dogs get it. It could be bad news for the dogs. Ultrasound is useful in detecting the hydatid cyst. Laboratory diagnosis is finding the protoscolases, brood capsules or daughter cysts, after surgical procedures. You can do serologic testing for echinococcus. I haven't seen that IgG or IgM uh, antibodies to echinococcus. I've never seen for echinococcus though. And here's the life cycle. There's the worm uh, here, right here, and then embryonated egg in the feces and then accidentally consumed. And it goes through all these organs here until it decides to, to settle. And then um, the oncosphere here, and then and then it develops into 
once it's inside uh, the human, then you get the, the cyst development. And I have a better picture of this in the cyst development. Uh, protoscolex forms a cyst, and the scolex atta attaches to uh, the intestine. Whoops. The intestine, and then here's the worm again. So here's uh, between a dog and a sheep. Definitive host, dogs, and other kind of... Uh, other um, um, animals, okay, intermediate hosts, sheep, goat, and swine. But this is where it causes damage in the humans it, when it would migrate and uh, create this uh, the cyst development right here. Okay, so here's the high data then. So when um, it infects an organ, let's say like this is like uh, the bladder. So it would infect the bladder as initially as high data sand. This is hydatid sand. And then it would develop and then develop and develop and develop. And this, can, this whole thing can be, like I said, as big as basketballs. So that's Echinococcus granulosus, pretty significant parasite <clears throat> causing hydatid sand. All right, the next group of parasites, intestinal tissue and roundworms, class nematoda. Nematoda are the roundworms. The roundworms, Ascaris lumbricoides, a giant intestinal roundworm. That's a pretty common parasite. And then the hookworms, uh, Necator americanus and Colostoma duodenale. Those are two, the old world and the new world hookworms. And then you got Strongyloides strictoralis. I think that's a hookworm. The eggs look just like the, the two previous hookworms, the, the Necator and the Ankylostoma. And then there's Enterobius vermicularis. That's a pretty, um, I've seen that one in real life. Uh, Enterobius vermicularis, easy one to identify. I've seen also too, the next one, Trichurus trichura, which is the whipworm. So Enterobius, Trichurus, Trichura. And I haven't seen Trichinella spiralis, but that's a, a bad one to have too, because this parasite can lodge into your muscle, cause muscle aches, and it's really tough to get rid of. Okay, the smallest nematode parasite of man. So these three, the last three parasites are, are more common than the hookworms. And you, you would identify uh, the presence of these parasites by, by looking at the hookworm eggs. Okay, actually all of them you can identify by the eggs, which you should be able to do by Friday. And then Vucareria bancrofti, uh, filarial nematodes, and then loa loa, which is the eye worm. Loa loa is the eye worm. Um, more nematodes, Oncocerca volvulus causes river blindness, another eye parasite. And then uh, Dracunculus medinensis, the guinea fire worm or dragon worm. Okay, nematodes. Nematodes are generally free living and parasitic. Uh, if they're free living, they're found in the water and the soil. Parasitic, they would latch onto plants, mollusks, mollusks uh, annelids, which are worms, and arthropods and vertebrates. Uh, general more general characteristics, the adult worm is, has a thread-like body, cylindrical in cross-section, and it's unsegmented. Basically, it looks like a, uh, a straw with pointed ends, okay? Pointed on one end and pointed on the other end, okay? And it's, it's not segmented, okay? It's not segmented. The sexes are separate. Males are smaller than the females, which means that uh, not hermaphroditic, hermaphroditic, which means uh, hermaphroditic means it's an animal that possesses the sexual organs of both sexes, okay? But here you have males versus females. Also too, as a general rule of thumb that you might wanna know, <clears throat> Uh, when identifying male worms versus female worms. If you see like a nematode and you wanna know if it's male or female, the male worm will generally have one end coiled, okay? The one end will be coiled. It'll be like a, you know, like a, at the end of a pig, you know, pig's tail, how it's coiled and curly. Well, that's what'll happen in a male worm. It's coiled or it's curly. The, Female worms generally are pretty much straight. Nematodes have a complete digestive tract. Uh, morphology consists of the body wall, nervous system, uh, 
all these other systems, digestive, excretory, and rep reproductive system. Method of attachment of the nematodes for strongyloides, it penetrates the tissue. Usually it's the filario larva. It, when it's developing, um, the filario larva will be the one that will penetrate the tissue and uh, latch on to uh, whatever it can latch on to. Usually it's a, a portion of the intestine. Ankylosma is oral attachment as well. Uh, it will just like bite, bite onto your intestine and it'll just stay there. Uh, method of attachment for ascaris is retention in folds. And that's folds of the intestine, like the villi. The villi have folds, uh, the intestine have folds called villi. And that's where ascaris uh, will be uh, located. Ascaris is a, is a common parasite that um, usually mothers of infants uh, would bring into the ER. Uh, you know, I've seen this a couple of times when, uh, when I was in the Navy where I would go to the ER and the mother would be frantic and she would bring in a mayonnaise jar filled with water. And she said, I found this in my baby's diaper. And it would be, it would be like an ascaris, ascaris worm. So those are easy to identify. Like I said, it's a pretty simple worm. Uh, it's unsegmented and it's pointed at both ends. And then, like I said, for the male, the male has one end coiled and the female is pretty straight. So I identified it. Okay, it looks like it's Ascaris rumbricoides male. And uh, now that you know how to identify Ascaris rumbricoides, you'll be able to impress people. Because when I said Ascaris rumbricoides male, uh, the doctor was pretty impressed. Now you now you have that skill in identifying Ascaris. Uh, for Trichuris, that's another um um, the egg, I like the egg because it's easy to identify and it'll be easy for you pretty soon when I show you um, what it looks like. And it anchors itself with attenuated ends. That's trichurus. Usually it's, it's called trichurus trichura. Ankylostoma, uh, the hookworm. Uh, method of obtaining nourishment, it, it'll latch onto you, it'll bite onto your organ, uh, the intestinal organ, and it'll just suck blood. Um, Trichurus will ingest uh, lice uh, tissues and blood, and that's how it gets its nourishment. Ascaris would feed on intestinal contents once it latches on. It's kind of like Diphilobothrium latum, that's the tapeworm. Remember the broadfish tapeworm? Would, um, where the Diphilobothrium latum will um, intercept the vitamin B12, this one will just feed on intestinal contents. That's Ascaris. And then the filarial worms, ingestion of food from body fluids. Usually the filarial worms, worms, and I'll show you later on, it's the worms that creates, uh, causes elephantiasis. So the filarial worms would um, be found in the lymph, or, lymph uh, nodes or lymph organs, okay? The eggs of the nematode fertilized versus, uh, uh, like for example, Ascaris, you have fertilized corticated, unfertilized corticated. There's different comp uh, combinations of cortication, and I'm not going to have you memorize that. It's it's too complicated. All I want you to know, know is how to identify ascaris, and I'll show that to you uh, when I go over the slides tomorrow. Daily output is a lot, twenty to twenty thousand. Those are the eggs. <clears throat> okay, intestinal roundworms. Ascaris lumicoides, like I said, that's one of the more common ones. Uh, usually the mother would say, I found this in my baby's diaper and she would be freaking out. And then she's, and then she would think that her baby has a major parasitic infection. Well, it could be, but anyway, that's one of the more common ones that um, um, patients bring in their worms that they found either in the toilet or in their baby's diaper or whatever. Okay. Female lay the eggs, pass in the feces, infection by ingesting the eggs, and the egg hatches, and which forms the rhabditiform larva. And the larva will migrate, liver, heart, and lungs in one to seven days. The larva will also get into your lungs, the alveolar capillaries, bronchi, and then swallowed. So sometimes when it gets up into your respiratory tract, the eggs will get into your lungs, actually into your throat, and you would actually cough. And when you cough, you would think that you're coughing up, um, uh, you know, maybe like a dust particle or your, your throat is dry. 
where you would cough and then swallow, um, that could be a larva that could be entering into your, your throat or coming out of your um, coming out of your lungs. So you would cough, then swallow, and then it gets back down into your, your digestive tract. And so this worm makes its way throughout your body, liver, heart, and lungs. And then when it's in the lungs, then you cough, then you swallow, and then back it's back into the gut. These see how the edges here are kind of look kind of lacy. That's how the egg is called corticated. It's corticated, fertilized, corticated, unfertilized. But like I said, I'm not going to have you memorize the difference between fertilized and unfertilized and corticated and non-corticated. All I want you to do is know how to identify the worm. So here are two, two worms here, illustration. You see how the tail here is coiled like this? Well, that's a male. And then this one, this is not coiled, this is just curved. So this is a female. Usually the males have that coiled in just like that, okay? Males are coiled. Pathogenicity, the disease is ascariasis, uh, can cause vague abdominal pain, obstruction, and feeling of fullness, ascaris lumbricoides. And then uh, when there's migrate, when the eggs will migrate or the larva will migrate, then that's when you would spike in your eosinophils. Eosinophils go up. So if eosinophils go up, uh, what else should you see in a stool specimen? Well, because of the increased eosinophils, you'd probably see uh, the charcoal-laden crystals, okay? Charcoal-laden crystals, not on the peripheral smear, but in the stool, okay? So if you're doing an O&P exam, um, then you should, and if you see, uh, if there's a, elevated eosinophil count, then you should see charcoal-laden crystals. And it's deadly during times of migration. Uh, intestinal bacteria pathogenicity for ascaris, intestinal bacterial infection, nutritional effects on children. So here, the worm would intercept nutrients found in the intestine, just like uh, for diphenylbacterium latum, it would intercept vitamin B12. So here, it would steal nutrients uh, nutrients from the children and consume it themselves. Astrosomycoides is the most common helminth infection. Pass from the anus, nose, nose or mouth. Like I said, it's the one if if a mother freaks out and sees the worm in her baby's diaper, this is the one that she's probably bringing to the ER. She says, this is what I found. Please identify it. Well, you all know how to identify it now. The adult is either white or pink, which I've seen conical posterior and anterior means it's pointed at both ends. Three oval lips, uh, smooth, finely striated cuticle. Okay, it's not segmented. The male has a curled tail. Always remember that. And the female is paired reproductive organs in its posterior two, posterior two thirds. So the female is is straight with tapered ends, and the male is curled, has a coiled or curled tail. That's the worm, and that's the worm. And that's the typical color that you would see. It looked like a, it would look like um, a tubing, you know, rubber tubing. And this is a, a section of intestine where it looks like a lot of ascaris worms uh, infected this patient. They took, it looks like they took out a portion of the intestine. The egg, like I said, there's corticated vertical, decorticated vertical. The cortication is basically, it has that, uh, looks like uh, lace around the edges, uh, corticated non-fertile and decorticated non-fertile. I'm not gonna, like I said, I'm not gonna have you memorize each specific uh, description, fertile, non-fertile or corticated, decorticated. See, and here's corticated and here's decorticated. All I want you to do is know how to tell me that this is ascaris or Ascaris limbicoides. Okay, here's the egg again. Um, this is corticated. Okay, and this is where I'm supposed to stop if I'm doing one lecture, but I'm going to continue. Hookworm. Okay, Nicator, and it's I learned it as Nicator. You can call it Nicator, but not around me. I learned it when when I took parasitology. My professor was really into pronunciation 
and he called it Necator. So it's Necator Americanus and Ankylostoma duodenale. These are the hookworms. Necator is the new, new world uh, hookworm and Ankylostoma is the old world hookworm. Both of them are hookworms. The eggs, you can't distinguish between the two. All you can do is call them hookworm eggs and they're not really that hard to identify. Uh, humans are almost exclusive hosts, and the adults reside in the long, small intestine. <clears throat> okay, and the eggs must reach a favorable environment. A lot of times it needs, when the eggs are migrating around, if it doesn't settle in one place, then it becomes non-viable. And the eggs will develop into a rhabditiform larva, and after rhabditiform, it will it'll develop into the filariform larva. It's just another stage of development, but it's the filariform larva that is the one that causes damage. It's the one that uh, will penetrate tissue. It's the infective form. So the infective form of this larva is the filariform larva. Okay, the hookworm that enters hair follicles, pores, or unbroken skin, and then it gets into your bloodstream. Then it's going to travel around your body. It'll go through the lungs, throat. Same thing. You know, once it gets up into your throat, you'll you will cough a little. And then when you'll swallow uh, the larva, <clears throat> larva, and then it will get into your digestive system, get into the intestines. Okay. So it, it'll make its wrong. That's what they, they call it the cook's tour. So it would get into your lungs, throat, and your organs, go throughout your organs. Then when it gets up into your your throat, you'll cough a little, you'll swallow it, and then it'll get into your stomach and intestines eventually. Um, settles in the mucosa of the small intestine, and it eats blood and uh, develops eggs. And the eggs are passed in the feces. And you saw the eggs a while ago. Remember the corticated, uncorticated, etc. Okay, so the filariform larva, like I said, is the infective form. If um, if it's out in the uh, um, like water or soil or whatever, the, the floriform is the infected form. It's then it would penetrate like your heel, okay? And that's how you would get. It. That's how uh, the human would get it. But once it's inside you, uh, it's inside you, and then you would cough it up, and then it would settle into your um, small intestines. Then you would uh, excrete it out, and then you have eggs and developing into rhabditiform. The filariform, the infected form, and then uh, infect the patient again. So that's the life cycle of um, the hookworm. <clears throat> Pathogenicity um, contracted by contact. Uh, contact meaning that it would the filariform larva would uh, it penetrate your skin or ingesting the eggs. Okay, this worm sucks blood, and as a result, because it sucks uh, blood it can actually create a hypochromic microcytic anemia. Uh, that takes you back to hematology. It's a hypomicrocytic anemia. The adult is a small cylindrical tapering at both ends. So that's typical. It looks like a straw that's pointed at both ends. It's small cylindrical and tapered at both ends. It means it's kind of pointing at both ends. Um, morphological difference between two species is the buccal capsule. The buccal capsule is basically the mouth, uh, the mouth of the worm. Buccal is the mouth. Uh, Negator has dorsal pair of semilunar cutting plates, but uh, Ankylosoma duodenale has ventral pairs of teeth. And here is uh, Negator americanus, and that's the buccal, buccal cavity right there. And that's on Ankylosoma duodenale. I think that's on your test. So make sure you remember this face. It looks pretty ferocious with the cutting, with the teeth there. Okay. So that's Ankylosoma duodenale. The adult male has a broad translucent membranous caudal bursa. And that's this. It looks like an opening. It looks like it's, um, it's not tapered on this end, but it's um, the caudal, which is the tail. Uh, with rib-like rays, okay, and that's in the male. The female doesn't have this. And uh, the adult female, that's the mouth of the female, has pointed tails, okay? 
the male has to open um, the caudal bursa where it's open and the female just has a pointed end tail. And also too, the female is larger. Usually for the worms, the male is the smaller of the two sexes. Okay, this is a female, pretty straight. And this is a male with the open caudal bursa, okay? So in negator in the hookworm, it's, it's not a matter of being coiled. It has this opening, the caudal bursa. The female doesn't have an, uh, any opening like that. It just, it's just pointed at both ends. The eggs of uh, the hookworms, you can't differentiate, okay? You see a hookworm egg um, once and it'll apply to both negator and ankylostoma, okay? It has a thin transparent sh shell and two to cell, two to eight cell stage division. So this is what you would see. You see the shell, this clearing on the egg, and then you have the, the nuclear material. So you, if you see this egg, it looks like it's within uh, this clear thin shell, and that's probably a hookworm egg. And that's exactly what it will look like as I've actually seen it in real life. The rhabdiniform larva, uh, cannot differentiate between the two, uh, the, meaning the two species. And rhabdiniform larva is larger, more slender than stir, uh, strongyloides stercoralis. Okay, so hookworms again, tapered at both ends. This is probably a female, okay? Filariform larva, that's the, that's the stage. The filariform larva is infected. That's the one that will penetrate your skin. If you're walking in uh, uh, water or soil that has the filariform larva, then be careful, make sure you have to be wearing shoes because the larva will actually penetrate your skin and get into your circulatory system. Okay, um, more hookworms, that's a female. Uh, human is the principal host for strongyloides, free living phase and parasitic phase. The filariform larva, like I mentioned earlier, as a parasite, uh, the filariform larva is the infective form. So three types in the life cycle, there's direct parasitic soil to human or indirect, uh, which is free living and auto infection means it's within the host. <clears throat> but you won't have to know that. Um, basically, I want you to know how to identify these parasites. Okay, I've shown you the eggs, I've shown you the worms. Strongyloidiasis causes uh, conchinchina diarrhea. A light infection, maybe um, you won't be able to tell if you have that infection, but if you have a heavy infection, oh, you'll know you, when you have it because you have chronic dysentery and weight loss. Uh, Strongyloidiasis is contracted by skin penetration of the filariform larva. Remember, filariform is the infective form that migrates to the lungs and is fatal to immunocompromised hosts. Identifying characteristics, the egg resembles hookworm. So would, it would, so the egg would have that thin shell uh, uh, surrounding the nuclear material. Once you see that it's a thin, clear shell, then you can, you can, the best you can do is call it a hookworm, hookworm egg, whether it be negator or ankylostoma or strongyloides. Rhabdiform larva uh, diagnostic stage is common in feces. The esophagus of the worm is if there's an hourglass uh, shaped esophagus, just like here. So, so here's the esophagus. See how it narrows right here? So that's called an hourglass, hourglass shape. So that's classic for strongyloides stercoralis. It has this narrowing here uh, in the head and uh, it's strongyloides. Okay, here's here's the worm again, and then you have another. Um, if you can see the hourglass esophagus right there, and this is rhabdiform larva. Filariform, filariform, remember, is the infective stage. It's rarely seen in feces. It has a notched tail. Okay, the next parasite is the pinworm. The pinworm, uh, I kind of like because I've seen it. I've seen this parasite actually um, on the bench. And pinworm or Enterobius vermicularis. Humans are the only known 
hosts and the adults live freely in the large and small intestine with no larval migration. So the eggs are swallowed or inhaled, or you can be infected hand to mouth. And as a result, or you can have perianal scratching. So this is a parasite that will affect adolescents and children, okay, um, young kids. They would swallow the eggs or inhale, or they would infect themselves um, hand to mouth. And uh, one of the things about the eggs is that uh, it'll cause perianal scrap, uh, itching. <clears throat> the disease is enterobiasis or oxyuriasis. Uh, pruritus is under the uh, term for itching, pelvic inflammation. And enterobius or the pinworm is the most common helminth infection in the United States. Usually, generally, it's in the Southeast, but it's the most common helminth infection in the United States. Half the cases are asymptomatic. And when you have it, when you have it and you have the symptoms, you know you have it because it's a pretty itchy area. Um, symptoms that also include grinding of teeth and sleep associated with the disease. You have poor appetite, sleep and weight loss, abdominal pain, and uh, nausea and vomiting are experienced. The adults pair of lateral cephalic uh, alar wings. So this is an image of, of the worm, uh, lateral cephalic alar wings. Uh, the male, again, in this one is similar to the other worms where the male has a curved tail. Okay, usually the male, if there's a curved tail, then you can you can be safe to say that it's a male. And the female has a long pointed tail with prominent esophageal bulb. The eggs, the eggs I think are the most diagnostic part of this parasite because it uh, has a couple of descriptive terms. I've heard flat football and I've heard loaf of bread. So it's oval with one side flattened. Okay, it's oval with one side flattened. So, I, I learned uh, about this parasite and it was as described as flat football or it could be like a loaf of bread. Okay, see how it's flat on one side, flat here and oval. So either loaf of bread or flat fo football. So I've seen this, I've seen this uh, parasite on the bench. And there's different ways to collect um, uh, collect specimens. Usually, uh, when it would migrate onto the skin, especially the eggs, that's would it would be found in the area of itching. So there's a cellulose tape, cellulose tape uh, test where you would take a, a piece of tape, sticky side down, apply it to the the itchy area, then pull the tape off, put it on a glass slide, and read your slide and look slide, and then look for eggs. Another way they have all uh, these commercial paddles that are sticky on one side. So you uh, tap the itchy area with the paddle and hopefully the eggs will, will stick onto the sticky side. And then you look at the paddle uh, underneath the microscope and you look for eggs, okay? Uh, Interrobius vermicularis is not diagnosed with O and P, OVA and parasite test. Okay, so you wouldn't go through the, the flotation technique or the, the zinc flotation technique, et cetera. You would diagnose it by doing the scotch tape test or taking a sample uh, from the skin, the itchy area. Uh, tape is looped around the tongue depressor. This is the procedure. Tape is looped around the tongue depressor, sticky side out. Then you would apply the sticky part of the tape to the skin, and hopefully you'll, you'll collect eggs that way. Examine under low power. Uh, you may use NIH swabs and you continue doing this for seven days. You don't have to continue for seven days unless you see it positive. If you see it on the first day, then you have to stop. You don't, you don't have to continue on. It's positive for pinworm and terobius. The next parasite is Trichuris trichura. I've also seen this parasite on the bench. And this is a uh, this also has unique um, features on the egg because it has what's called a bipolar plug. So enterobius vermicularis is easy to identify because it's flat on one side. Uh, remember, flat football or a loaf of bread. 
Trichura is trichura. If you remember, if in the name, it's kind of redundant. So you think bipolar plugs. Plug on one end and then plug on the other one. I'll show it to you when I show you the egg. Man is the principal host. Uh, adult females lay eggs in the feces. Uh, Old embryonate in soil. That's the infective stage. Trichoriasis is the, the disease um, causing whipworm infection. Um, what you'll see is uh, diarrhea, blood streak diarrhea, uh, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, anemia, weight loss, and rectal prolapse. So trichuris trichura will um, cause rectal prolapse, and it may be fatal if you have a heavy infection. So here's the life cycle. So these are the eggs here. You can see on both ends, bipolar plugs pass in the feces, and then will develop. and develop here and then you have um, advanced cleavage, embryonated eggs are ingested and then it's uh, accidentally consumed. Okay, this is a male, males, males, those are males. Okay, remember the male has a coiled end and there's rectal prolapse. Move on. Trichuris trichura, whipworm, diagnosed by finding the ova. And the ova, like I said, are pretty unique. It's lemon-shaped, uh, looks like a football, not one flat on one side. And it has what's called bipolar plugs, a plug on either end. That's the trichuris trichura, just like this. Okay, this is a classic egg, and I have seen this on the bench. Okay, trichura, trichura, whipworm. Obviously, these are a bunch of males with the coiled ends. Um, shaped like a whip. Uh, think posterior, anterior, esophagus, posterior, intestine. But these are the eggs right here. Uh, not eggs, but the worms right there. Coiled on one end, those are males. Male, curved tail with single spicule and retractile sheath. Female, bluntly rounded posterior end. Okay, so this is a female. Okay, next parasite is Trichinella spiralis. Trichinella spiralis is a pretty significant um, parasite. It's found in pork. It's found in pork uh, or pigs. And uh, the reason why this is serious is because the parasite will lodge into your muscle. And it's, once it's in your muscle, it's hard to get rid of it. It'll, it'll cause muscle pain. And you would have to like cut into it, do surgery to get the parasite out. So the trichinella spiralis is um, uh, a significant organism that can cause a lot of pain. The larva insisted in striated muscle of raw or undercooked meat or pork. Okay, it just likes, it'll lodge itself into the muscle of the host. Male and female copulate, male is expelled, female produces a live larva and blood. The larva will migrate within the human, lymphatics, heart, arterial circulation, and finally end up in muscle fiber. Okay, so the larva will migrate throughout your body but its final resting place would be in the muscle fiber. Okay, so here is the life cycle of Trichinella spiralis. So male and female worms uh, produce uh, juveniles, and then the juvenile worms will migrate into the muscle, muscle of the host, and the, the host could either be like a pork, a pig, or whatever, or one of these animals. Uh, and for humans, we, we would, eat uh, infected pork. Uh, humans are infected most often by eating uh, improperly cooked meat products uh, that contain infected juveniles. That's why you don't, you never want to uh, eat pork um, rare, okay? You need to thoroughly cook your pork, okay? So uh, in, humans would get it by ingesting uh, meat that uh, has the worm in it. And then what will happen is the worm will, uh, will multiply, make more worms, and then it's passed, and then, and then it migrate to the muscle tissue. And then now you have another host that's infected. So 
it lodges into the muscle tissue that's uh, usually a, a, a pig and then uh, and then it's consumed and it's eaten and that's the life cycle okay it, it lodges into the muscle you eat the, you eat the muscle tissue and then um, and then it forms more eggs and more worms and then that's, so that's pretty much the life cycle okay you see ham right there and this guy's eating uh, raw or uncooked pork Trichinella spiralis uh, pathogenicity causes trichinosis. So like I said, you always want to thoroughly cook your pork. Will cause diarrhea, gastroenteritis. Uh, and another significant symptom is muscle pain, periorbital edema. So that means the, the worm can get into your eye. And symptoms include fever and weakness. Uh, overwhelming infection is fatal. Um, if, if you have infection through, all throughout your body, overwhelming infection can be fatal to the patient. And that's muscle right there where the worm has insisted, E-N-C-Y-S-T-E-D, insisted into the muscle fiber. And you identify it by doing a muscle biopsy or serologic testing or detecting eosinophilia, but usually the muscle biopsy is what will identify this parasite. Identification, worm is slender anterior end, long narrow digestive tract. The male, ventrally curved posterior, female, bluntly post, uh, rounded posterior. So for trichinella spiralis, you probably see a slide like this, where the worm has insisted, uh, created a cyst in muscle tissue. Once you see this in muscle tissue, that parasite is Trichinella spiralis. All right, now we're going to get into the filarial worms, uh, blood and tissue nematodes. Uh, characteristics, arthropod transmitted. There has to be uh, an arthropod vector. Other general characteristics and conspicuous buccal cavity. Female gives birth to prelarva microfilaria. Uh, then it goes through development, has some delicate sheath present in the eggshell. Uh, the life cycle, man is the only definitive host um, for Bucuraria. This is the first, uh, this is the first microfilarial uh, parasite, and it requires a mosquito. And this is the one that causes elephantiasis because the adult worms uh, are located in the lymphatics. So once it's in the lymphatics, it would multiply and create problems. Um, pathogenicity, uh, it'll cause varicose lymphatics and cause elephantiasis, just like this. So uh, it would lodge in the uh, lymphatics and it would cause elephantiasis there and there and there, okay? Bucuraria bancrofti, um, you identify it, let's see. You identify it by doing a thick and thin smear. Thick and thin smear, uh, like I mentioned, uh, it's similar to the procedure when identifying um, malaria. Malaria, you also do a thick and thin smear. The thick smear is you take uh, whole blood, EDTA whole blood, uh, smear it on your glass slide about the size of a dime, let it dry. And then for the thin smear, you just prepare your feathered edge on, on the smear and then you do a right in this thing and look for filaria. The thin, but the thin, uh, the thick smear, excuse me, is the one that hopefully when you stain it the next day, when you lyse the red blood cells, hopefully the parasite will remain on the glass and you'll be able, should, uh, be able to see the parasite. That's the objective of doing a thick smear is that when you do a thick smear and you go through the staining procedure, it, it lyses the red blood, the red blood cells and hopefully the parasite will remain on the glass. So um, that's what will happen in the thick smear. In the thin smear, obviously, the red cells are still intact. So you'll hopefully you'd see the parasite uh, with the red blood cells on, on the smear. Okay, that's the Vulcararia, another image. Next parasite is Loa Loa, which is the eye worm. Loa Loa is the eye worm. Humans and monkeys are the definitive hosts uh, found in subcutaneous tissue. Uh, the worm gains access to your bloodstream and um, it 
it just um, parasitizes your bloodstream and you can see it on the peripheral smear, microfilaria ingested by the, um, the arthropod, which is the mango fly. Okay, the arthropod vector is the mango fly. Pathogenicity can cause meningoencephalitis, uh, the adult in the CSF. So this is a pretty significant, it gets up into your head, uh, uh, to your brain, and then you'll actually, you can actually probably see the worm in your, uh, in the eye, okay? Ophthalmologist, I, um, ophthalmologist who I went to actually saw this once. So loa loa is the eye worm. But in, once in the brain, it can cause meningoencephalitis. The disease is low loiasis, uh, and it's limited to the African rainforest. So this is where loa loa is found in the African rainforest. Identification and biopsy of some cutaneous tissue, thread-like cylindrical worm, blood smear. Uh, you would see it on the blood smear. These are filarial worms. Single stylet at the interior and sheath nuclei extend to the tip of the tail. And that's somebody's eye where the doctor's actually pulling out the worm. That's the patient's eye right there. Next parasite is uh, another eye parasite. It's called Oncocircovolvulus. Uh, life cycle. Um, the microfilaria are ingested, and the arthropod vector here is the black fly. Okay, the black fly. Pathogenicity has an inflammatory reaction, nodules of varying size, eye lesions, and the disease is called onchocerciasis. Okay, causing river blindness. Identifying characteristics. Uh, Tissue scraping of the eye, no sheath, no nuclei of the posterior end. Usually at the CLS level, um, they look at the, so for the filarial worms, they would look at the, the tip of the, the worm and looking at, um, it says like no nuclei in the anterior or posterior end. And at the CLS level, then they'll, they would actually count the number of nuclei at one end and, and use that to speciate. But obviously we're not gonna do that in this class. Life cycle adults in subcutaneous tissue. Um, you can get it contact with fresh water uh, and uh, contact with fresh water and release the larva. And you can get it by ingesting micro crustaceans or copepods accidentally swallowed. So these micro, micro crustaceans contain larva and uh, copepods accidentally swallowed. That's how you get this worm. No response to first migration, secretes a toxin, you get an allergic reaction. This is dracunculus, secondary infection ulcers, and the worm dies if it fails to reach the skin. This is dracunculus. Dracunculus metanensis. Okay. This is the guinea fire worm, uh, adult worm and skin lesion. Okay, and then there's a procedure for this. The knot procedure is actually a procedure for um, concentrating parasites. Uh, that's, that's, you think there are filarial parasites in the blood where you would take one ml of blood and mix it with nine mls of 2% formalin solution. So you have a one, one in 10 solution. Uh, the, solution kills, the solution kills the microfilaria, but you're still trying to identify if it's in the blood sample. You let it stand for 12 to 24 hours. Then you centrifuge it after 24 hours, centrifuge it for the 10 minutes. Decant the supernatant, and then you have your bullet. Drop the sediment from the bottle and spread on the slide uniformly. And then you would look for parasites. Let it dry overnight. You do your right gimbal stain and um, de-stain 10 to 15 minutes in 7.2 pH air dry it, and then look at it under the microscope 100X. And that's it. That's it for this semester. So um, tomorrow, when I go through the review, like I said, if, if you haven't already gone through the review, you should, you should um, like I said, I sent you several uh, PowerPoint 
um, slides, but in different segments, hopefully that you put them all together on one file so that you can go through, um, I think it's 113 um, PowerPoint slides uh, into one file. And then all you have to do is just keep hitting the down arrow button and you would uh, just, answer, just answer, just identify what you see. And like I said, on the test on Friday, you will have a word bank, so it shouldn't be too hard. You won't have to know how to spell. Uh, you'll just have to either write it out or tell me the, the letter of uh, the name of the organism. Are there any questions at this point? So in previous classes where I would have more time, there would actually be a multiple choice and matching portions of parasitology. Fortunately, because I guess there's a little confusion between the academic calendar and the school's calendar that um, I was short, I was actually short a week. So fortunately for you guys, you won't get a multiple choice or a matching exam. And that's where all the other information that I pass in throughout these lectures, uh, you would have to know alternate names like Loa Loa, uh, Trichuris Trichura, uh, the other names like that. So, but that's okay. But that's okay. So um, tomorrow we'll just do the review, uh, the malaria life cycle, and the slide review. And then after that, then we'll do we'll do uh, the exams on Friday. I'll also be giving you passing out the, your effective objectives, where I do an, an evaluation on uh, how you did in the class, and then I would rate certain certain traits of how you did, and then. You'll sign it, then I'll give that to Dina. And then um, and then we'll go from there. Are there any questions? I had a question about the homework. Um, okay. For the last homework for this. Due Friday. That'll be okay. due Friday. 23, number 23 will be due Friday. Any other questions? Okay, if not, I will see you all tomorrow at four o'clock. Okay. Good night. Good night.